We will begin our luncheon speaker, Sasha Meinrath, uh, with us from uh, Penn State. He is the Palmer Chair in Telecommunications, and he's going to be speaking with us today about rural broadband. Sasha, everyone. Thank you. And uh, I split my time between Penn State University on the one hand, where I, I, I profess, I teach to uh, unsuspecting students, uh, and Washington, D.C., where I, I run a tech policy institute. And um, as you can imagine, broadband is one of these areas that is both in my backyard and also one of national import. I can tell you the view from D.C. is bleak. And I say that because when I look at what's been happening with broadband across the United States, I can tell you for certainty that what is officially being said about the state of broadband in our communities is not at all the on the ground reality. So with that in mind, when the state of Pennsylvania said, hey, we'd really like to do an assessment of how broadband is going in this state, I said, well, Let's use this as an opportunity to, in essence, develop a methodology for tracking ground truth on the ground reality and use that then as a leverage point in state and national debates. And that's what I'm going to talk with you about today. So the work that we did here at Penn State is via a tiny grant, a $50,000 grant from the state leveraging a multi tens of millions of dollar infrastructure that we've built over the last 10 years with a variety of different partners. These are the folks that worked on this particular project, but there's many, many others standing behind them, making it possible to do what I think you will agree by the end of this presentation is a pretty remarkable feat of documentation. Let's see if this will work. There we go. So broadband mapping really took off after 2010. We developed a national broadband plan in 2010. And I was a heavy skeptic of this plan, not because it's not a good idea. It's a fantastic idea to have a plan. The problem is this wasn't actually a plan. These were sort of aspirational goals with no process, no idea of how to get there. Among them, in 2010, we said we're going to have universal, 100% baseline connectivity. Well, we're like three months away from 2020. That's the goal for universal broadband connectivity. And I would suspect that every single person in this room is either directly impacted by a lack of connectivity or certainly knows a multitude of people who don't have broadband connectivity, and I suspect don't have a plan for getting that broadband co connectivity between now and January 1st. So with that in mind, there is this official myth. And let me show you what this looks like out of the mouths of the current chairman of the Federal Communications Commission. This is our national broadband map. Has anyone ever gone to the national broadband map and put in their home address? A couple of you? Highly, like if you're, if you're really needing a chortle sometime, go there, put in your home address and see what they tell you is available at your house. Uh, it's a remarkable hyperbolic overstatement of reality. Um, and it leads to things like this. So this is a JIT pie saying that in 2018, we basically have most of the entire country covered with connectivity. Oh, it gets worse. <laughs> so the reality is quite a bit different. And here's what I think it could have been. This national broadband map could have been a vitally important and useful tool for everyone if we had accurate and precise information. And I've been saying this actually for quite a while, and I've been pretty public in saying, well, I'm skeptical, and here's me in 2011, publicly declaring that if we're gonna spend $350 million of taxpayer money, oh yeah, did I mention the national broadband map cost us all $350 million 
to create that. And keeping in mind that we built a better one for $50,000 from the state of Pennsylvania. This, to me, is kind of an epitomization of what's going awry. It doesn't matter if you're Democrat, or Republican, or something else entirely. That we're simply not doing accurate and precise data measurement, which leads then to a bizarre reality that we're all living where the official measures are saying, like, look, we're fine. Which leads us to what we were doing. We wanted to explicate, in essence, what the official stuff says, what we're gathering on the ground, and the discrepancies between the two. So we used what's called the FCC Form 477 data. I don't anticipate that anyone is familiar with this. If you are, God bless you. But what it really is, is self-reports from internet service providers of where they offer service and how fast those speeds are. And that exists with no verification whatsoever. This is perhaps best exemplified by the last data collection that the FCC has released where they didn't catch the fact that one internet service provider wrote in and said that they have universal gigabit fiber connectivity to eight states, including Pennsylvania. It took an independent watchdog group to say, I don't think that's correct, leading in May of this year to the FCC revising their data set to exclude that one provider's information, how many additional overstatements are in there? Well, a lot. And what we wanted to output then were these state and local maps looking at that official thing with this measurement lab platform, self-reported speed tests from the customers of internet service providers. And then we could look and see like, well, how are customers faring versus how are ISPs saying what's available and the speeds and what have you. I know this will be shocking to you, but they don't line up very well. So our initial goal for, and then this is just 2018, which is you know one year of data collection. We said we're gonna collect a million tests, a million data points from across Pennsylvania as a mechanism to verify or not, as it turns out, what the official maps said. Now, we knew that we could probably get close to a million tests because we had a historic archive from 2009 to 2017 of data that we'd collected from Pennsylvania. Remember, I mentioned this multi-million dollar platform we were leveraging of quite a few tests previously. What we quickly realized is that interest in broadband has exploded over the last couple of years, and particularly starting in 2018. And by the end of 2018, we'd collected over 11 million tests just from Pennsylvania. There's 11 million times when people went, clicked a button, ran a speed test, and provided us with the results of that speed test. That's a lot of data. And the reason why we were able to do this if anyone goes to Google and types in something like broadband speed test or broadband test or what any of a zillion variants, the thing that appears above the search results is us. It took us four years to get that relationship in place. But what it means is we've harnessed the power of monopoly for good this time by ensuring that people were able to have access to a speed test developed by the scientific and research community, run by the scientific and research community, utilizing an open source tool that then made all of these data freely and publicly available to anyone that wants to use it. That stands in marked opposition to pretty much every other speed test and process, et cetera, that tries to keep you from looking under the hood to see why are we getting these crazy results? Well, here's, <laughs> you guys will laugh at this. Here's the official Form 477 map of Pennsylvania. 
And what you'll see is there's a whole bunch of different forms, different technologies used to provide broadband service and that it covers the entire state. 100%, 100% coverage of Pennsylvania, officially. And it leads to a kind of like a really boring map. Like, here we go. That's the official FCC map, which shows universal broadband connectivity across the entire state. Show of hands, who believes this map? I can tell that Comcast is not in the house. Okay. Here we go. Here's our initial results for this state, right? So again, this is based on 11 million tests. Here's download speeds by county. Now what you might notice, I can't see the legend, but I know it's there. Uh, oh, there it is. Uh, is that we didn't get any counties with speeds above 25 megabits per second as the median speed. That was our initial assessment. We've actually spent a lot of time trying to figure out how you could actually get to a point where you could report out broadband speeds for a county. It's really tough because the reality is that's not, in fact, what we're seeing across the whole state. Here's Indiana County because, you know, I'm here in the heartland. So why not take a look at this? And here again, you can see universal connectivity across the whole county. Like, I don't even know why we're here talking about this because officially mission accomplished, no problem. Here's the official FCC map again, just as boring. Here's our median speed. What's the 50th percentile that people in Indiana County are getting? This is based on a few tens of thousands of tests that were run right here and an oddly squat Indiana County map. Um, but you can see 4.71 megabits per second. Now, if you dive even further in, you see it's really, it's, there's a couple of places. Actually, I guess Indiana itself is doing pretty okay. And then there's the rest of the county. 4.71 megabits per second as the 50th percentile. That means that 50% of Indiana County that took this test have worse speeds. And this is just to the people that could take the test. We all know there's a lot of people that can't take a broadband-based measurement test. <laughs> given that they don't have connectivity in the first place. So, where does this lead? Well, in our backyard, my backyard, we know that the speeds are all over the place. Some people have really fast speeds. I think, you know, if you look at this, you can see that there's a bunch of people that have like super fast speeds in State College, 400, 500, 700 megabits per second. This, by the way, if you ever look at an internet service providers report out, they'll always tell you the average right? And I, I like to tell people, you know, it's like if Jeff Bezos walks into the room, on average, we're all a billionaire, <laughs> right? Like there's a reason why they report averages and not median speeds. Because as you'll see there, and in pretty much every place we looked in the entire country, the median speeds are shockingly less than the averages. So this reality that the official maps are showing doesn't map onto what we experience every day. And in fact, when we started breaking this down by smaller and smaller sectors, this is by state representative district, what I want to point your attention to are those green areas, right? That if you can look at way down here in the microscopic mm -hmm. print, what you'll find is those are the areas of the state that meet the minimum criteria to qualify as having broadband connectivity. That's a little different than the official map, right? What's going on here? So let me give you a sense of just how bad things have become. Because there's also, I know, I'm just a ray of sunshine here today, folks. Uh, there's this assumption that things are getting better. And I don't want to completely disregard that. Connectivity is increasing, right? But our official maps are hiding something that's really bizarre. So this is the differentials in December of 2014 
between what ISPs were self-reporting, the speeds that were available, and what people were actually receiving. And what you'll see, that little tiny dark green, dark green is bad. That means the differential is greatest. That means that people are experiencing speeds that are far less than what internet service providers are saying is available. So here's 2014. By 2015, it goes away and we're like, hey, we're making progress. Things are getting more accurate. But then something odd begins to happen. So you see the dark green now is quite a bit larger. That's around Wilkes Booth. Uh, but by 2016, and especially, if we can get this to go, by the end of 2016, much less by 2017, what you begin to see here is that our official measures, not in the cities, look at Pittsburgh and Philadelphia, and you'll see that those are, those are orange and what have you. That means that people in those locations are basically getting what the internet service providers are reporting. So what do all these green areas have in common? Those are the rural areas of the state. And those are the areas where the internet service providers are systematically, increasingly overstating what they're providing versus what people are actually receiving. And unfortunately, because the FCC is a bastion of efficiency, the last data set they've released is from 2017. So we're still waiting for them to catch up to today's reality. I'm sure that the maps will continue to be just this bad. So let me be clear, this, that one little green spot of hyperbolic overstatement became in just a th three years, this. So at least a goodly portion of the progress that we report out as having been made as a country is not based on a reality, it's based on ever more hyperbolic overstatement by the internet service providers as to what they're provisioning. And we have 15 million data points through 2017, another 11 million data points from 2000. We have a lot of data that show that this isn't some sort of outlier, that this is systematic and statewide. But remember that multi-million dollar crazy leveraged platform with, you know, Google search, you know, dominance, uh, we were able to do this at the whole country level. And so here's the map of the entire United States. Here are the differentials between what the FCC is collecting from, F from folks and what people are actually experiencing. This is December of 2014. You can see, you know, there's a couple of dark green spots, hither and yon. And here's 2017. So it's not just the state, it's the whole country. And of course, these time frames span both Democratic and Republican administrations. And I can tell you, like what's being proposed right now still isn't going to fix these problems. So what are the implications of this? Well, pretty profound, actually, and myriad, in fact. All of our maps are inaccurate. That's pretty widely understood. They're differentially inaccurate. They target for maximal hyperbole rural areas in terms of the overstatements. And they're getting worse over time. So we've paid $350 million up front and we keep pouring millions of dollars into it. And whatever this crazy methodology they're using, it's getting worse, not more accurate. And, because the government, we base eligibility for the funds to rectify these digital divides upon our official maps. Right, so in essence, by becoming ever increasingly hyperbolic, we're making ineligible more and more places in the country that are facing an ever widening digital divide. And the thing is, I mentioned, I split my time between here in Pennsylvania and Washington DC, so I get to talk to key officials 
FCC folks. I get to talk to the administrator of the RUS fund, the $600 million, Chad Roop. Like, he's a, a good guy who wants to do right. And he, they all know that this is totally crazy and are, in essence, bound by precedent and occasionally statutory mandate to exclude areas that have craptacular service because the official documents, the official maps say everything is fine here. It's a terrible state. It's one that we have made worse over the past 10 years since the national broadband plan that isn't an actual plan. So we clearly need to do a lot more documentation. We're collecting right now from the United States about 750 to 800,000 broadband tests a day. So in 2019, we'll have an additional, it'll be somewhere around 300 million broadband tests being run. It's funny because the FCC chairman right now is like, well, if we could verify this information, we would totally use that data. And I'm like, <laughs> I've got some data. I've got like half a billion data points I'd love to give you for free. We'll see if he takes me up on that offer. So beyond this, though, there's a whole lot of other stuff. Here we go. So automating the data collection, right? Automating the visualization. This should go live within the next, I'm talking with, I talked with the, the development team yesterday, probably two months or so. So what will happen by 2020, I hope, is that we'll have all of this publicly and freely available for zero dollars and zero cents to anyone that wants to investigate data in their own backyard, that anyone that wants to build maps. And I have it explicitly from, for example, the head of the rural utility services at USDA, that they will take our data into account when determining eligibility. And I think a lot of agencies are going to do likewise. In essence, they've said, now that we've acknowledged that our official maps are no good, where else can we turn to provide verification that there is a problem that needs solving? That we need a grant, a loan, some hybrid, what have you. And we want to be doing these kinds of maps for every place in the country. And again, we have the initial maps already publicly and freely available. We also think that we need to collect pricing. We know for a fact that beyond, ex beyond actual availability, pricing is the number one barrier to adoption of broadband. It's kind of crazy because everyone's like, yeah, duh. Well, you'd be amazed by how obtuse the official decision makers are because the FCC at the beginning of August released a new notice of proposed rulemaking to fix the maps. And pricing in this 100-page document doesn't even show up. Even though the FCC itself conducted a study showing that pricing is the number one barrier to adoption. Nobody wants to touch this. You can all imagine why, but I'll just state it so it's explicit. Telcos have wrapped themselves around our government agencies in a way that is highly problematic and is detrimental, extremely detrimental, to rural America in particular, but in essence to the entire country. So we have like the national, what is it, the National uh, Bureau of Economics, what have you, that says the cost of not having broadband connectivity, because you don't get all the efficiencies and what have you, is about $2,000 per year per household. So you all know how many households are in your communities and you can figure out very quickly that this is an enormous cost. And as I mentioned earlier, we're terrible at measuring the opportunity cost. Yes, it's going to cost us a lot of money. And it's funny, I just testified to the state legislature last week and they're like, how much is this going to cost? And I was like, billions. And everyone's like, whoa, you know, like. And I'm like, but it'll cost us billions more if we don't do it. And that's just the reality in which we live. So our data is pretty crazy. Here's the entire United States. That vertical line, 
That's the line separating places that achieve the FCC's minimal definition for broadband. And as you can see, there's like four states in the entire country that managed to do that. They're all northeastern states. And you can see Pennsylvania sort of, oh, maybe you can't see because that thing is also microscopic, but Pennsylvania is like 10th or 11th or what have you. We're doing okay vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the country, but we are literally along the East Coast, we're surrounded by states that are doing better which is weird because we've already invested through tax abatements and rate flexibility. That's what we called allowing Verizon to charge us all a lot more, uh, around $18 billion. Let me repeat that. We've already invested about $18 billion through rate hikes and tax abatements to provide a mandatory universal connectivity across the entire state. That's called chapter 30. It's in law. And when I testified, I was like, so I don't understand. Like the law is pretty clear on this, what's happening. So now we have a couple of Senate resolutions to investigate what's been going on. It's even more awkward because Verizon testified in December 2015 before the state legislature and said, we have accomplished universal connectivity across the state. Everyone's like, what? Yeah, seriously, you can Google this. It's all in the public record. So our data is pretty cool. We've got 20 petabytes. So, you know, we're now on to terabytes. That's the next thing. You'll soon, probably in five years, be at about our petabyte drives. It's also funny because we have this Institute of Cyber Science at Penn State. It does big data. And they're like, hey, we've got 15 petabytes of storage that anyone at the university can use. I've got, I've got a 20 petabyte data file. <laughs> it's a lot of data. Right? Because it's not actually just this state, it's not actually just this country, it's actually a global platform. So we're collecting data all across, all around the globe. Um, we get 250 million tests for 2018, we're gonna beat that this year. It's again, a lot of data that we're collecting for science. Over 750,000, I think we're now north of 800,000 tests a day being run. And uh, we have data through a couple of days ago. It's live and available publicly, again, for free. Like I'm not actually selling anything, quite the opposite, in fact. We've been trying now for 10 years to give these data to the FCC for free. And they have systematically been like, you know what we'd really like to do is spend more money on more worse data <laughs> as our policy. It makes me bonkers. I think eventually they will come around. Uh, we'll see. So the FCC is releasing December 2017 data. We have like data through Tuesday. And it's all free and publicly available, unlike pretty much every other data set of this sort. You can go and explore this right now at that website, the broadbandtest.us website. And start playing around, looking at FCC data, upload speeds, download speeds, our data, discrepancies between the two, any data between 2014 and today, all of that, all available right now. You can use it for your eligibility maps and what have you if you're applying for grants. It's a useful data source. We're upgrading that entire platform over the next 60 days, uh, so it'll do even more, which is kind of fun. And that's about it. I want to leave time for questions, comments, etc. I'm a wealth of useless information that in this context is profoundly useful for once. So thank you. Hi, um, can you tell us what incentive does an internet service provider have in over reporting the delivery of their service to the public? Yeah, there's a couple incentives. One is it obfuscates where their actual footprint is. So there's a competitive, you know, misinformation propaganda kind of side of things. It also, and they know this, it makes ineligible areas that otherwise might see competitors or municipal networks or anything else, right? Once you've excluded that area, you sort of like you've kept everyone out of your future expansion areas. Yeah, so it's pretty profoundly bad incentivization, but oftentimes it's just pure laziness, 
like because there's no actual mandate to be accurate and precise and no repercussions for providing inaccurate information, this is what we get. And I've been telling people, you know, there's a solution here to vastly improve our official maps that will cost zero dollars. And that is simply to mandate that, say, within 30 or 60 days, that an ISP must provide service to any place where they say they provide service. Right? Like, that makes me the crazy radical in DC. I'm like, I don't understand. <laughs> like, you know, right? So they would then self-correct because they wouldn't want to overstate. And we would get more accurate and precise maps because of that. Thus far, it's fallen on deaf ears, but you know, always the optimist, said Don Quixote. Yes. <laughs> okay. Hi. Oh, thank you. Comcast is in the house, actually. All right. <laughs> um, I, I will agree. There, there is sections that of the uh, state, many sections that do not. It, this is too close. That, that do not have broadband service. Um, there, there's the digital divide, and there's the um, ability to, to build out. Um, but what I really want to address here is, is the speed test, because there is um, the speed that, you know, we're obviously going to advertise, because the vast majority of, of our territory, we do offer gig service but most people don't subscribe to, to the gig service. So if you're doing a speed test and saying that, oh, I'm not getting gig service because Comcast says I have gig service here, then you know, you're, they're not subscribing to that level. Plus the age of the device and the number of devices in the homes will also slow things down as well. So that's something to, to take into consideration and then the other thing I wanted to address too was the availability versus the actual subscribers. And just as I had alluded to in the beginning, where there is no availability, which, you know, absolutely there are areas with that. Um, but in terms of um, speeds, and here in Indiana County, Crickside. They have the exact same services as the city of Pittsburgh and Philadelphia have. Whether they want to subscribe to them, you know, here, here again, like I said, with the uh, gig service, and we offer, oh, probably about six different levels of, of speeds that, that um, people can um, subscribe to based on their, um, their budget, the income, and we also offer a um, lower income option to... Um, low-income families that would qualify that will offer them internet and uh, the purchase of a computer at a reduced cost, significantly reduced cost. Well, thank you for that. Uh, and I think that's an honest essence as far as it goes. Like, I would be overjoyed to work with Comcast to look at why we're seeing these discrepancies between rural and urban environments. I'm going to assume that people in rural America don't as a whole have just older devices than people in urban areas. And Comcast, again, they testified before the state legislature a couple weeks ago with me. Uh, and they said, look, you know, 99% of our coverage area has gig service. And they were testifying under oath to that. And I was like, well, that doesn't make sense. Why are rural communities not adopting at the same rates as urban communities? I think it's price. And so I guess my pushback would be, would Comcast be willing to work with me to explicate what the pricing structures are? Because then we can investigate that. So give me your card. <laughs> okay, well, we'll see. If it happens, folks, it happened because of this conversation, which is gonna be great. Like, <laughs> but no, I think there is something going on with pricing. And yep. I wanted to address this to the Comcast lady. First of all, I live in a suburb of Shalakta, and Comcast is not available out there. Second of all, exactly how much do all these different fancy plans cost? It varies on whatever. Well, can you give us, like, what is the cheapest, and then the next, and the next? Um, 
offhand, I'm, I'm not 100% sure, so I don't want to misquote anything. But I'm saying like an average of like $70 a month. We'll just say like an average. And here again, that'll fluctuate. Okay, seventy dollars a month for essentially what has now become an essential service that we all need. Thank you very much. But again, I think this is why we need an independent, objective, like audit of all of this, because then we could answer this question definitively. And it's not just Comcast, right? Obviously, there's a lot of ISPs that are charging who knows what rates. You could imagine going to like a grocery store where you're like, I'm going to buy a dozen eggs. And they're like, we'll tell you what it is after you check out in terms of the cost. But you can imagine buying a dozen eggs where they're like, we'll give you up to a dozen, right? Like <laughs> you get like one and you're like, oh, that sucks. Well, that's, that's the reality of broadband service provision right now. We've been pushing for a guaranteed minimum as what should be the new bar, right? That I don't care what it's up to. It could be like up to infinity. If I never get that, it's not a useful metric for determining what can I count on when I'm buying a service. Where else? Yes, sir. I'm County Commissioner Rod Reddick. I would feel that I need to make comment only because um, Indiana County has been suffering with uh, the lack of not only broadband but cellular service throughout the county. Yeah. And a lot has been published regarding the impact that Indiana County has economically. And, and I appreciate what you're doing at Penn State to get the data correct. Uh, we've spent a lot of money on grants that required data collection. And the data we had was just terrible. Yeah. It was uh, overstated in the part of the, uh, uh, the vendors of use. Uh, I, I heard the young lady talking from Comcast. I think we have a meeting coming up with you soon. And I'm anxious to get in one-to-one -one with you on that uh, meeting. Um, there is a lot of frustration in this audience, uh, particularly for the lack of impact it has uh, the, not having broadband and the impact that lack of broadband has mm -hmm. on the agricultural community. And everyone has to realize that you have large areas of rural America sitting out there with a lot of property uh, owned and operated by individuals who work almost 20 hours a day to manage themselves, their kids are working, no access to cellular service or broadband. They go to school, they don't know anything about uh, uh, improving their, their home site. We have reached out to just about every vendor there is. And uh, frankly, we're not getting a lot of service. Mm -hmm. um, it's not that they're not serving those in areas where there is a connectivity or there is a a number ratio of homes to use. I understand that. It's it's a money market out there when it comes to the service. Um, what, what frustrates us is that as we move forward, we're trying to move forward as a county to find the next step. Where do we go from here? Because we know the data. Thank you. It just reinforces where we know we are. I testified to the state not too long ago in the same kind of issue and the impact it has on our county. When we want to install uh, broadband, there are areas of the county that are not even serviced by any kind of optic fiber. Now, the problem is fiber has been strung across Pennsylvania mm -hmm. by Penran. And we have dark fiber and lit fiber throughout Pennsylvania, yet we don't know where all the fiber lines are. Yeah. Is there any collection piece that is going on at Penn State that would be helpful to counties to resurrect some of those dark fibers into lit fibers? Let me, let, let me tell you what I heard the other day, and this would be, I, I hope you have more information than I, I learned about. <laughs> Penren that spent multi-million dollars stringing fiber across Pennsylvania that we competed against as a county, by the way, and lost big time. Right now, they're sitting with only 109 users across Pennsylvania. Is that correct? Um, I don't know the number. I do know that their users tend to be like institutions. So Penn State would be like a user. So yes. Yeah. And we have a large user in Indiana, mm -hmm. IUP. And we, mm -hmm. we applaud the fact that they have that capability. Yeah. Yet, I don't see any kind of marketing effort by the state on that particular fiber from Pennsylvania, in Pennsylvania, 
that would allow businesses and residences to take advantage of pen rent. Yep. And someone needs to market that. If, if you're saying that's IUP, then we need to go that direction. But I'm, I'm just hopeful you have that information on, on the fiber capability. We know where we are on the other data piece. Uh, but I just want to thank Penn State for what you do. We're, <laughs> We're, I'll, we're, I'll pass along the good word. <laughs> we, are, we are dependent upon that information. Yeah. We can't be successful. We can't afford to do any more surveys. Mm -hmm. we, we don't have enough money to even trigger a change here in Indiana County to upgrade our systems where there is, there is a hole. The, the, someone spoke about Crickside. Uh, we are in, we're in an attempt right now to at least get cellular service out into some of those remote places, but that is not broadband. Mm -hmm. It may connect at some point. So please continue what you do. Thank you for what you do. Thanks for being on the agenda. And uh, we look forward to seeing you and I look forward to seeing Comcast. Thank you. Yeah, yeah so the assessment of where we've already put assets, uh, so State Senators, you know, Senator Phillips Hill and then Representative Snyder are both working on doing exactly that, of doing a systematic assessment of what do we even have available? It's not been done. Uh, so you know you're not out of the loop and I'm not more in the loop. It's, it's piecemeal. People sort of learn about different assets that are available. Often there's some sort of acceptable use policy or statutory mandate as to why it can't be shared. It, I share your frustration. I have been fighting for almost a dozen years on things like clarification of E-rate funded lines. These go to schools, libraries, hospitals, etc. It's often the only line in smaller towns and villages. And while it is not explicitly illegal to share that, the statute is unclear. And therefore, most organizations who don't want to lose the subsidies for E-rate won't share it. And what it means is, again, we've already bought and paid for connectivity that, say, in schools goes unused in the evening times when the students at those same schools most need it. And we just squander it as our policy, as our national policy. And so I'm saying for zero dollars and zero cents, you can make more efficient use of something we've already bought and paid for. Why wouldn't we do that? And the same is true of dark fiber. In 2009, we wrote a huge paper looking at what we called the building a 21st century broadband superhighway. I spent three years and three CTOs at the White House working on this. We ended up with a 2012 executive order from then President Obama. He wiped out all the build out and sharing requirements and just kept the permitting expedition components of what we had originally proposed. Well, here we are, seven years later, same problems, just much worse. And again, this is where I keep coming down to, we're just so terrible at understanding the opportunity costs that communities, local economies, farmers, but also teachers, health providers, you, know, you name it, are all suffering under the weight of this lack of connectivity. And we haven't even done the minimal due diligence to know what is already available, what is already bought and paid for, how can we make more efficient use of the assets that we, the people of the United States, already own? So I, yeah, I absolutely feel like this is one of these critical battles of our time. We have time for two more questions. How would you feel about broadband internet becoming a federally mandated public utility like water and gas? <laughs> I'd feel really good about that. Uh, and I say that because that's, in essence, where it came from. And we privatized the internet in 1994. Uh, so for the first two and a half decades, this was all government owned and operated with pretty stringent acceptable use policies. Until 94, it was against the acceptable use policy of the internet to have anything commercial on it. So if you ever wondered why from 2000, from 94, that next decade was such a generative, all these huge mega companies got founded, it was because it was a land grab. It was for the first time it was okay 
to do something commercial on what is the internet. And in 2005, relatively recently, is when we had the Brand X Supreme Court decision. That decision eliminated what's called Title II classification. It basically said it's no longer going to be a common carrier. Many of us remember when you used to be able to dial up and we used to get like new coaster every week, right? In the form of a CD, <laughs> right? The reason why you had so many different providers is that all of those services were covered under Title II common carriage. Now we jettisoned that and from 2005 to today, we've also gone from number one on the planet when it comes to broadband connectivity to middling. I don't think that's a spurious correlation. So whereas I wouldn't want government ownership, I certainly would want a lot more controls, accountability, et cetera, just like we have had for decades with telephony, a universal service mandate paid for by a universal service fund. That's part and parcel for telecommunications in this country. And we learned that the hard way. That was the only way to solve these problems. Somehow we've jettisoned what works, spent a lot more money in the interim, cost us in our fees and what have you, a hell of a lot more than we otherwise would have paid, and then declared success based on hyperbolically incorrect information. And I'm like, well, hold on a sec. We already know what works. And other countries, oddly, took what worked in America, applied it there. It works better there, whereas we're going the opposite direction. So I think that's a great question. And I think telecommunications history bears out that there are smarter, faster, better, cheaper ways to do this. But it's like, if there's a good idea, we're like, what else? Understanding what's already in place makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. um, are there two or three other things that should be done or could be done to expand the number of people that do have internet? I mean, what measuring it's terrific and it yeah. gives you that understanding. But what's the next steps to start to spread it out throughout the country? Yeah, so I'm kind of business model neutral, which, which surprises, you know, everyone, including Comcast, right? Like, you know, I'm like, I'm thankful that we have a number of mega service providers, but I'm also kind of aware, you know, as a telecommunications history professor, like I'm aware of the history. Now, we pretend like we have meaningful competition when we do not. And so I, as a free marketeer, would say this is not a functional market. Right? You can't have the self-corrective elements if you don't have market competition. But we pretend like we have a competitive market space. So we don't need the kind of oversight, accountability, and dare I say it, regulations to protect us. And you know, in some ways, I don't blame internet service providers because I understand that they have a fiduciary responsibility to maximize profit. And we have allowed that to be done <coughs> at the expense, especially of rural communities. So we can argue about you know, what's the best options for service providers once we have meaningful numbers of service providers. In the interim, I'd say dump any barrier to entry. Support any entity that wants to provide baseline service. So it's crazy that we don't do that. Like Something is clearly better than nothing. And we won't, we, as a matter of national policy, we won't engage in both a competition policy kind of argument and discussion. In fact, I'm already seeing the, 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 you know, the AstroTurf groups being like, we should not talk about competition policy. And I'm like, what? <laughs> uh, but also, you know, going back to farmers, when you look at how telephony was spread, it was the cooperatives, it was the home rule, it was a, you know, the live barbed wire telephone systems that were pioneered by groups of folks getting together and self-provisioning. Now, we're told that doing that for telecommunication services is you know, really hard or impossible. I got my start in 99, 2000, building out networks in farm country of central Illinois. Yeah, see, props, right? Like, so I've climbed on the silos, I've worked with folks, and I can tell you for a fact, like, this isn't rocket science. Like, if you can put up a television aerial and get your VCR to work in the, like, this is a lot easier than that. And so, for me, what's critically important is that we kind of 
create a rich ecosystem of different business models, different technologies, et cetera. That's the robust, reli reliable network of networks, right? That the internet is supposed to be when we're all the cheetah, right? When we're all just one particular element, that is very dangerous. And, you know, again, we used to know this and we've moved away from that in the US. When I do comparative analyses of regulatory and business and market sectors in the US and internationally, you see like pretty much every country that's doing better than us either has one of two things, a meaningfully competitive market or drastically more government oversight and accountability. And we have neither of those. All right, so this has been a very interesting conversation. Uh, yep. A lot of passion on this topic. And it's definitely a conversation we should continue. Um, you know, thank you for being here today My and sharing this information with us. Sasha, Man <laughs> mind wrath, everybody. Thank you.